أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ورسلا قد قصصناهم عليك من قبل ورسلا لم نقصص السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد So dear brothers and sisters after ما شاء الله تبارك الله الحمد لله so many lectures about Adam عليه السلام and what we can learn from the story of Adam we are now down to the very 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 last lecture this is it this is the finale of uh, the Prophet Adam alayhi salam for our series. Um, and uh, I have saved um, one of the most difficult topics, uh, if not the most difficult for the last. And frankly, I have been dreading this topic since the very beginning. Perhaps even I confess I might have gone into too many tangents to kind of delay this one. But the time has come to discuss one of the thorniest and one of the most problematic issues for modern times. And that is what do we as Muslims do in light of the Adamic story vis-a-vis -vis the almost unanimous consensus of all factions of the scientific community regarding the notions of man having evolved from previous life forms over the course of many, many millions of years. Now, uh, obviously, uh, this is not a series of biology, and perhaps many of you who are watching this uh, series are not specialists in biology or evolution, and I have a confession to make, neither am I. Uh, I am not a biologist, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. In fact, let me also confess that I never really quite liked the science of biology even as a child, and I have not touched the subject uh, as an entire discipline since high school, which uh, by the way is ironic because uh, my wife is a biology high school teacher, so go figure that. But I haven't touched uh, biology really since high school, and it's not something I'm going to be teaching you uh, in this uh, series. So if you're not knowledgeable in biology and evolutionary biology, well, firstly join the club. And obviously this is not the time or place to give you a crash course, and neither am I the best teacher for that subject. However, uh, for today's lecture, because we're dealing with Adam alayhi salam and because we're living in, in modern times and because it is my uh, nature and my niche as well to really get involved in these types of issues and be very pragmatic and practical. And as all of you who are aware, who know my lectures, I, I don't mince my words. I don't speak in platitudes or throw out slogans. I don't believe in this. It's not, it's not going to solve our problems. We have to uh, demarcate the area of, 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 you know, that is problematic and then try to attempt to solve it or at least give some guidelines. So I'm going to, this lecture will consist of 10 basic points, right? Each one of these deserves a full lecture, but we do not have the time to get into all of that. And before I begin, I want to make my usual disclaimers uh, because SubhanAllah, we always have to worry about, and Allah has tested us for people who, for whatever reason, they love to take those 10 second snippets and cause an entire social media drama. You know, may Allah يعني, deal with uh, those that are insincere amongst them the way that they deserve to be dealt with and expose them for what they really are. And those that are sincere, may Allah guide and forgive them. But the point being, we have to be very, very clear. This entire uh, lecture, I will be saying things that are kind of pushing the boundary, what ifs and what not. But I want to make it a very clear disclaimer that I am, alhamdulillah, a believer in the Quran. And I believe in the existence of Adam. And I believe in the entire Quranic story of uh, Adam alayhi salam. So as I preach and teach, and as I'm going to be giving these lectures, please do not misunderstand a 10 second snippet out of context. I'm saying it as emphatically as I can. I believe in the narrative of the Quran, and I believe in Adam alayhi salam and his wife Hawa as being the primogenitors of all of the human species. So that is the disclaimer. Now, let us uh, move on. Point number one, there's going to be 10 points, brothers and sisters. Point number one. Most of the Muslims who dismiss uh, evolution uh, should be very careful about the words that they use and what they say. And the fact of the matter is that really any Muslim who has studied the science of evolution, who has understood evolutionary biology and the theses and the premises and the evidences, any Muslim who understands the theory of evolution from within the paradigm of science will never simplistically dismiss it as most people who haven't studied do so. 
only the one who understands the evidences and knows the rationale behind the theory of evolution will be in a position to understand why it is potentially problematic. Remember, dear Muslims, our religion, Allah Azza wa Jal demands of us academic excellence. Allah says, "Wala taqfu ma laysa laka bihi ilm." Do not speak about that which you do not have knowledge of. If you do not have knowledge of a discipline, don't speak about it as if you are an authority. We don't want other people to find fault with our faiths because we have not presented what needs to be presented in an academic manner. Because we might make an, a mistake in how we express ourselves. So, if you really haven't studied the theory of evolution, if you don't understand its, its premises within the scientific community, then just be quiet about it. Say, I don't know, Allah knows best. Do not be amongst those who just dismiss it and say, oh, it's all completely, it's a conspiracy theory to do that. No, please be academic, understand that there is a potential, a potential clash between the religious narrative and between the theory of evolution. And whether you understand or agree with this or not, I will tell you firsthand that May Allah protect us, but many people are doubting and maybe even leaving uh, the faith because they cannot understand and they cannot reconcile between uh, uh, what they think is science and what the Quran is. And especially when uh, clerics come along or even you know Muslims that are pious and righteous and they dismiss these concerns because they haven't studied. And they say, oh, all of you guys, you don't know anything and it's just a theory and it's all a conspiracy. When they dismiss it without even understanding then this only compounds the problem. Either speak with knowledge or be silent. Well, it's not a problem. Say, I don't know, this is a very good question and go to the experts and the specialists. And we have to understand that the evidences uh, for this theory as posited by the scientific community from within their own paradigm, they are quite solid evidences. So if you haven't studied, uh, homolog uh, <laughs> I'm gonna make some scientific terms and I know I'm gonna mess them up because it's not my field or forte. I haven't studied biology as I said from the very beginning, so I'm not teaching you biology. Nonetheless, if you haven't studied the evidences from the, for the theory of evolution from uh, uh, anatomy, from uh, the fact that that shared uh, species, excuse me, share extremely similar physical features that seem to indicate common ancestry. These are called homologous, uh, excuse me. Uh, these are called H-O-M-O-L-O-G-O-U-S. I'm trying to pronounce this homologous or homo homologous, one of these two. I don't know the pronunciation, but I'm just reading the book here. That uh, uh, I've read a number of books about this uh, in terms of uh, understanding why it's a problem. I have never taught obviously biology. So the point is that there is this notion or there is this um, understanding that species share extremely similar physical characteristics, which indicate a common ancestry. Obviously you also have the evidence from molecular biology, from DNA, from our genetic codes, which again reflect a type of shared ancestry. And in fact, if you understand how uh, uh, DNA uh, forms, you, if you understand how the DNA structure gives you the information that you need and how you can easily map out specific species re being related to other species, you can effectively draw out a chart between the various species and see how they have been interconnected. We also also have evidences of biogeography. Biogeography is basically mapping out the geographic distributions of various plants and animals. And we can prove that in some areas changes occur and these changes are reflective of the circumstances of those areas. And this is especially true of remote islands that have been cut off from uh, large continental you know, land masses. These isolated islands, uh, perhaps a bird or a reptile migrated there you know, centuries or millennia ago and over the course of a few hundred years, we can actually see divergent species. So the mainland might have a particular type of reptile and an island you know, so far away might have another type which we clearly see is related and each one is not found in the other location. So this is uh, what is called uh, biogeography. Uh, so this is another instance of trying to talk about the evidences of why evolution occurs. Obviously we have evidences or they have evidences from fossils because Fossils indicate the existence of animals that no longer exist. And those animals are the perfect prototypes uh, of 
different species of animals. So again, the theory of evolution goes, for example, that foxes and wolves, let's just say, uh, uh, have been descended from uh, another species that no longer exists. So there was one species that walked on earth, and over the course of time, uh, this species evolved into different animals, in, such as foxes and wolves. So the point being that we have uh, fossils and even sometimes the actual DNA uh, can be uh, reconstructed that demonstrates that there were animals that fit the model of being a prototype of the animals that we have uh, currently. And of course, perhaps one of the strongest evidences uh, that, bi uh, that evolutionary biologists use to prove evolution is the fact that we have directly observed uh, what is called microevolution. We can directly observe small scale evolution in organisms with short life cycles. So for example, uh, whether you have um, you know, uh, amoeba or, or cells, or you have even flies or, or mosquitoes or whatever, things that have short lifespans. Scientists can over the course of a few years, maybe even a few months, literally uh, monitor how a particular species is adapting. Maybe the wing is changing, maybe they're developing some type of uh, uh, immunity against a, a disease out there. And scientists can see that over the course of a number of generations, what happens is a change occurs at the genetic level, at the DNA level. And this is called microevolution. And by the way, this is, uh, you don't even need to be a scientist to know this. I mean, every person who breeds horses, breeds dogs, breeds any, what are, like dogs is the perfect example. Every few years, another species, not a species, but another type of dogs, let's say, is coming out. Why, how, what's going on here? Again, these are breeds of dogs. And uh, the notion being that if you were to continue to do this for thousands of years, you know, you would get into a different species. Speciation would occur, a different species being created after many, many, many thousands of micro uh, evolution. So uh, we have not observed what is called macro evolution, which is uh, to see an animal uh, over the course of many, uh, you know, centuries or many thousands uh, of descendants become another animal, another species. The reason why we haven't observed this is because it takes too long. You couldn't do so in one lifetime. You could not even do so if it was even flying or whatnot. You need many hundreds or thousands of years of observation to do so. But the point being, if scientists say, if we have observed microevolution and we have seen market changes between one generation to the other to the other, to, to understand this and observe it, then to extrapolate this to many hundreds and thousands of generations, that is essentially macroevolution. So what the claim is, is that a new species doesn't just come about overnight. It actually takes many thousands of generations for that to happen. And we have observed the first few dozens or so of those uh, iterations. So these are all things that uh, bio uh, biologists uh, mention when it comes to trying to prove the theory of evolution. My point being, if you wish to speak about this topic, first educate yourself. Many people, many of our own Muslim brothers and sisters, they dismiss evolution, and I say this with respect, without even having a clue as to the actual problem that it poses. In fact, they can't even define evolution. Ask them what is evolution, and they will give you these, not even high school definitions, that oh, this means man are descendants of chimpanzees and apes. No, no scientist says this. This is, of course, the picture is there for you know kindergarten children of a chimpanzee and a human being. No scientist actually says this, we are not descendants of apes, even according to the theory of evolution. That's not what uh, evolutionary biologists um, say. So the point being, first educate yourself and even understand what is evolution. Evolution is uh, the descent you know, of a species with genetic modifications. That's really what it is, is that genetic modifications occur from generation to generation. So my first point, this is all the first point, it's one of the longest ones, is that and I say this understanding what I'm saying, so please don't take that 10 snip, snippet, uh, you know, uh, uh, second snippet and misunderstand me. I believe in the story of Adam, but I also say the theory of evolution overall is good science for its paradigm. It is a fair attempt to understand the reality based upon the scientific method. That does not mean it is right. That does not mean everything about it is valid. That does not mean it cannot be challenged. That does not mean it explains everything. What it does mean is that it is a valid theory based on the premises of science. And no Muslim should just dismiss it with a wave of the hand 
and say, oh, there is no such thing and not consider it to be uh, something of significance simply because they have not studied. I have not met a single Muslim who is an actual expert in biology, ev an, an evolutionary biology, except that they understand why the theory of evolution might potentially be a clash with uh, religious knowledge and understanding. So do not just dismiss it because of the term theory. Gravity is a theory. Light and how light reaches us is a theory. Doesn't deny the reality of gravity, does not deny that light is actually real and we see light. Understand that science is a process. Science is inference. Science is to see fact A, fact B, fact C, facts. And then try to develop a theory that explains the relationship between these facts. It is a theory insofar as it is an inference and Science is an ever-changing philosophy. It keeps on updating itself. It keeps on correcting its own paradigm. And given what scientists know about the, uh, uh, the facts of evolution, and there are certain facts that are undeniable, given what they know, then to extrapolate from it the theory of evolution is reasonable science. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it is correct. I'm saying it is valid from the scientific paradigm. Now, this is the first point. The second point, is that some of you are waiting for me to give the alternative to the theory. And let me immediately disavow any type of such notion. Ulama are not scientists. Preachers and teachers of the religion should not be telling engineers and doctors and evolutionary biologists what to research and teach. Let every speciality stick with his own speciality and let's learn from the mistakes of the Catholic Church when they thought that they could dictate to the scientists what to do and what not to do. Our ulama of the past did not tell chemicals, ke chemists and, and biology uh, biologists to, uh, what to say and what not to do. No, that's a separate discipline and let every discipline do its own research. Neither should a scientist be telling me what I should believe in the Quran and Sunnah and neither is it my job nor is it my job to tell the scientist what to believe according to science. I can and I should tell the Muslim scientists what to believe about the Quran. Yes, that's my job. My job is to explain the Quran, to explain our theology, to explain our text. And then it is up to the Muslim biologist to then try to see what he or she can do. Science has its rules, theology has its rules, tafsir has its rules, hadith has its rules. I am not going to tell a biologist what he should be researching and what he should say about the theory of evolution. That is up to him to do. And this leads me to the third point. That if I can speak about the Quran and theology, then, and of course I believe the Quran to be true, then what my job should be, and this is what I'm going to be doing, is to tell Muslim biologists and Muslims yani around the world who want to listen to me, what the Quran says and what it doesn't say. And therefore we demarcate the red lines that you cannot go beyond those red lines. It is not my job to propose an alternative to the theory of evolution. It is my job to say, if we believe in the Quran, which all inshallah of my audience does, if we believe in the Quran, this is what we can say, this is what we cannot say. When I posit, this is what we may say, I am not actually saying that I believe. I'm simply saying, if somebody were to say, what uh, I, I'm going to be giving an example. If somebody were to say this, the Quran allows this belief. To be brutally honest and to be very clear, I personally do not have, even in my own mind, an alternative for the theory of evolution because it's not my forte, it's not my area of expertise. And frankly, for whatever reason, people you know, are interested in different things. I'm really not that interested in, in trying to find some solution to this. I know many of my colleagues and friends who have an interest in biology, they also have a, a huge interest in trying to understand an alternative to this theory. Me personally, again, I mean, I am much more interested in uh, classical theology and the seerah and history and you know um, issues of the Quran and Ahruf, this is much more interesting to me for whatever reason. Everybody has a different brain and mind and different talents. Me personally, uh, it's not something that bothers me at all and you know Allah knows best uh, you know how what is the reality but I, I don't find problematic my, with my faith whatsoever but I do understand some Muslims do find this problematic and I do understand that they're struggling uh, in what to say. So third point here is that the job of preachers and ulama is to explain the Quran 
about uh, uh, Adam alayhi salam and when they do so, they're giving you the rubric. This is what we must believe without exception. This is a gray area open for interpretation and this the Sharia is silent on, the Quran is silent on. So this is what I'll be doing a little bit today in light of my previous lectures. And I hope inshallah by the way, that most of you, if not all of you have listened to the previous lectures. By the way, if you're just clicking this one lecture, uh, you know, wanting to get my opinion on evolution and whatnot, then uh, you know, inshallah it'll be a benefit, but it won't be as much beneficial as if you listen to this entire series and then come to this as the final lecture because you need to understand what I'm saying about Adam alayhi salam and what I affirmed about Adam and what I said is a gray area and what you know has been left uh, silent here. So that is the third point that my job and role is to preach the Quran and Quranic theology about Adam and then we leave it to the others. Now uh, to, to uh, Muslim biologists to do more than this. Now fourth point when it comes to the story of Adam alayhi salam, I mean we have been doing Adam for what, 20, 30 lectures now? It is crystal clear that the Quran presents a very distinct image of human origin. The story of Adam is mentioned half a dozen times. The imagery is so vivid. The narrative is so explicit. The sheer quantity of nouns and adjectives and the piece by piece uh, uh, telling of the, the, of the story clearly indicates that the intent of the Quran is for us to understand that there, that there was a real person by the name of Adam and that from Adam Allah created its mate and that from the two of them all of mankind as we know originated. This much is crystal clear. No human on earth exists except that his or her ancestry goes back to these, th this pair and this pair itself, it goes back to one. This is very explicit in the Quran and Sunnah and so the existence of Adam and Eve and the fact that they are our parents and all of mankind's parents, this is extra explicit from the Quranic narrative and anybody who reads the Quran must understand that the Quran wants us to believe this. This is the fourth point. There is no ambiguity in this. The fifth point that we come to is that if somebody says, okay, we believe that this is the intent of the Quran too and the intent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we understand uh, the story of Adam alayhi salam, it's very clear. But what if the point of the story is to be a story of morality and not a story of history. What if it is like a fable, a legend? What if it is like what we tell our children before they go to sleep? Once upon a time in a faraway land, they ruled a king. And so it is a fable. By the time the story ends, every child gets a, a, a moral from the story. So a group will say that we now have enough knowledge to understand that there is no such person as Adam. That's what they're gonna say. And that therefore we have no alternative but to take this story as a tale, as a symbolic fable, as a metaphor for us to understand that uh, we have a noble origin, that uh, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, is explaining to us the importance of obedience, the dangers of disobedience, that I Iblis is an entity we need to be worried about. So it's a symbolic tale. It's not meant to be taken literally. This is an opinion of some thinkers of modern times. Uh, and again, because this is public knowledge, it's not something I'm you know, inventing or whatnot, but many famous uh, scholars of our times, uh, thinkers I should say of our times, they held this view. Generally speaking, obviously, if you're going to hold this view, then you're not coming from the traditionalist camp of ulama, and that's understandable. And amongst the people who held this view is uh, the famous Indian uh, philosopher and poet Muhammad Iqbal, Allama Iqbal as the Pakistanis Indians say, Allama Iqbal, that he, he uh, posited that the theory, uh, uh, that the story of Adam is more of a fable, uh, an illusion than an actual real uh, history. And there are a number of, you know, uh, uh, thinkers who said this. Now, of course, um, uh, I am coming from uh, obviously a traditional ulama background and I, I cannot accept this to be honest um, with respect to Allama Iqbal and you know, inshallah he's forgiven and Allah bless his ranks. I'm not trying to criticize him or those who say it, but I must say I don't uh, agree with this whatsoever because the problem that is raised is at the very fundamental level of theology. The implications of saying that the Quran is teaching us a fable are simply too many to ignore. Because the Quran itself tells us in multiple verses that it is the truth. The haq is in the Quran. 
And Allah Azza wa Jal tells us the Qur'an is a clear guidance. And Allah tells us there's no misguidance in the Qur'an. And Allah tells us it is in simple language. And Allah tells us that the stories of the Qur'an are true. Allah tells us the stories are not fables. These are not just tales we are telling. Allah tells us you were not there when this happened. You were not there and I was there. Allah is saying that I am telling you, sorry, that يعني, Allah was there obviously in His knowledge. The point is that Allah is saying, you were not there when whatever happened, but we inspired you from the knowledge of the unseen. So the point comes that as Muslims, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahman and Rahim, and that He is Al-Hadi, the one who guides, and that He is the most truthful, and that He is the most eloquent. So if we believe that Allah speaks the truth, and that Allah has knowledge of the unseen, and that Allah wishes to guide, and that Allah is the most eloquent. Think about all of those things, right? That Allah speaks the truth, He never lies. That Allah, of course, has ultimate knowledge. No, no entity has uh, knowledge ex uh, 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 except if Allah chooses to give knowledge to them. And that Allah wishes to guide, and that Allah is the most eloquent. Then to claim that the Quran is deceitful, is symbolic, is lying, because really that is what it is. That you're going to say that for 14 centuries, everybody thought that the tale, the tale of Adam was true because the Quran is telling you it's true until modernity comes along and we understand that really it's not true. That it's like a fairy tale that maybe the five-year-old doesn't know, but the 10-year-old knows that, yeah, mama and baba are lying when they tell me the fairy tale, it's not a real tale. There's no internal evidence to tell us that it is a fable. The Quran is very clear, it's a true story. So to claim that it is a fable is to accuse, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, the Quran, any Allah Azza wa Jalla, really, that's the accusation. I mean, even though the ones who said this don't say this accusation, but what is the necessary, the corollary? You are saying that Allah is lying, basically. A'udhu billah. You are saying that this entire tale that was said is a fake tale, it's a fable, it's a mythology. And we don't believe this. The Quran is true, and its stories are true, and Allah is true. So when Allah says something and it is clear that it is a story, because somebody will say, oh, but aren't there aren't there parables in the Quran? The response is that yes, there are parables. By the way, I just wrote a book about the parables of the Quran. It's literally being released uh, this week or next week, the parables of the Quran. Yes, the Quran has parables. But every time the Quran gives you a parable, it tells you, we're giving you a parable, right? I'm giving you a parable, so listen to it, right? Their example is like that of. So whenever Allah gives a parable, he tells you it is a parable and you understand there's never an ambiguity. And when Allah tells you a story, He tells you it is the truth and He tells you this is what happened. There is not a single passage in the Quran where people are confused. Is it a parable or is it history? No, Musa, Isa, Dawood, Sulaiman, you know, every prophet of old, Nuh, Adam, these are stories that are his history. They are not parables and fables. So the claim that uh, Adam alayhi salam is a symbolic tale, a'udhu billah, it is actually a claim that the ulama would say entails kufr, even though the one who says it might be excused because of ignorance. Al-Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah and our Sunni ulama, they said that anybody who says that the Quran is symbolic, and that Allah is speaking to us in false truths, half-truths, that this person has accused Allah Azza wa Jal of lying, of being deceitful, and this is not an accusation within Islam. And they said this, by the way, about the falasifa, the, the pseudo-philosophers of um, early Islam, medieval Islam. They said that the falasifa, according to mainstream Sunni scholars, uh, they committed heresy. Why? Because they said heaven and hell are not real, they are symbolic. Allah is just يعني, giving a fable. Let the people believe in this is not real. Uh, and so uh, our mainstream ulama said this is not something that is acceptable. And the same can be said of those who denied the story of Adam here. We So the fifth point here, we cannot dismiss the entire story as being a fable without accusing the one who revealed the Quran of intentionally, intentionally lying, intentionally deceiving. And we do not believe Allah Azza wa Jal is like this and we do not believe his speech is like this. We cannot go the way of Christianity and Judaism because 
the bulk, the majority of Christians and Jews do not view their holy books as really being fully divine. They view their holy books as having kernels of wisdom and they can pick and choose as they, as they please. The majority of Christians do not believe in the story of Adam and Eve. The majority of Jews do not believe in the story of Adam and Eve. Only small groups amongst them, uh, they stick to the story and they say everything is true. We on the other hand as Muslims, our book is not like their book. Our Quran is protected, it is preserved, it is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we cannot go the way of Christianity and Judaism and say that oh our book is symbolic. No, it is truth and it is nothing but truth. So point number five, if you believe in the Quran, you must believe that the Quran is telling you that Adam was a real person and we are the descendants of Adam. We don't go this down symbolism. Allah did not reveal a symbolic crypto uh, book that is full of yani, tricks and puzzles. No, Allah speaks bilisanin arabiyyim mubin. Allah speaks in simple and clear Arabic. Uh, point number six, and again, each one of these points it deserves so much more, but as usual, time is limited. Point number six, the Quran, is not a book of science, it is a book of guidance. And so we should not expect the Quran to teach us anything to do with biology, chemistry, physics, engineering, architecture. Allah did not reveal the Quran to teach us science. Allah revealed the Quran to teach us our theology, to teach us why we are here, to teach us the broad aspects of morality. This is what the Quran is for. So. We should not expect the Quran to give us grandiose claims of science. And by the way, and I know this is gonna again, generate a lot of discussion in some circles. If you listen to my lectures, and even if you've read my books, and I have a book about the sciences of the Quran that I wrote, um, subhanAllah, over 27 years ago, subhanAllah, a long time ago. Um, even then, 27 years ago, and throughout my entire preaching and teaching, right? Is that you will never find me to be of those groups who, emphasize what is called the scientific miracles of the Quran. I am highly, highly, highly skeptical of this entire genre. And perhaps one day I will give maybe an advanced library chat about this, but I have never ever, uh, you know, uh, since reaching adulthood, obviously as a teenager, I did, you know, go into down this, this uh, genre, but as an adult and especially as a student of knowledge and then now who I am, never have I given an entire lecture about, oh, the Quran predicts space travel and the Quran predicts, you know, this and the Quran predicts that. I, I did not buy this back then and I still do not buy it now. And this, uh, and this is I know gonna raise a lot of eyebrows. Um, there are a number of, of uh, uh, experts out there who have spoken about this in a lot more detail than myself. Um, and uh, this issue of this potential clash with the theory of evolution and the Quran is actually one of the uh, byproducts. If you start going down this, this route of saying that the Quran is proven through science. No, the Quran is not proven through science. The Quran has, is not a book of science. Now it is true that we believe that the Quran will not contain any falsehood and that there's language in the Quran that indeed it is interesting and it is, it's very powerful that somebody 1,400 years ago in the Arabian desert would use such language. But to read in so many miracles, uh, you're creating a can of worms because when a non-Muslim comes and says, okay, well, you say the Quran is a book of science. Okay, well, science is telling us the theory of evolution and the Quran is telling us Adam and Eve. So what are you gonna do then? So I don't go down this entire genre and uh, this is not the time to get into there, but just FYI for the record that uh, I don't ever go around trying to prove the Quran is from Allah via the fact that it is uh, uh, full, full of scientific miracles. No, the Quranic truth transcends scientific paradigm. And we know the Quran to be true, not because it conforms to our understanding of science. No, if we go down that route, then we are, as they say in English, shooting ourselves in the foot. And I do not agree with this. In my opinion, to go down this route in the long run will prove to be more harmful than good and Allah knows best. This is the sixth point. The seventh point, I mentioned that the Quranic narrative of Adam is very clear that we believe in Adam, we believe in Eve, we believe that the two of them are our ancestors. Okay, but one point about the Quran which is very, very important is there is no timeline in the Quran. We are not obliged to believe 
that Adam السلام, existed in a particular time or particular location. This is in contrast to many evangelical Christians and other types of Christians and, and Orthodox Jews who believe that Adam existed 6,000 years ago. And they believe that all of human history is only 6,000 years old. Now this is not just highly problematic, this contradicts not theories, it contradicts facts, indubitable, yaqini facts. Without a shadow of a doubt, mankind has been on earth way more than 6,000 years. I mean, we have human structures dating back 15,000 years. We have paintings dating back 30,000 years. Paintings on caves, carbon dating more than 30,000 years. And uh, as for uh, species that are you know, humanoid, uh, hominid is the term that should be used, hominid, i.e. not exactly us, but like us, they go back almost two million years. You know, you have the Homo uh, heidelbergensis, you have the Neanderthals, you have the Denisovans, you have a whole bunch of different um, hominid species that are not exactly us, and they go back half a million, one million years. Stone tools were clearly used 250,000 years ago, and almost all scientists are certain that our exact species, us exactly, has been on earth for at least 100,000 years, actually more than this, but at least 100,000 years. I mean, the Aborigines of Australia are the most one of the most interesting uh, uh, case studies because the Aborigines, they had been cut off from the rest of mankind for many, many, many millennia until Europeans discovered Australia uh, in the 1700s. The Aborigines, you know, we don't know how they got there, but they were in Australia for not just centuries, for millennia. And we can prove through the artifacts and through uh, the structures left and through the, the bones of the Aborigines discovered, uh, buried over there, we can prove that Aborigines have been in Australia for 60,000 years at the very least. So Aborigines are human beings, they're still around, right? They're completely us, they are 100% human beings. They're not a different species, they're us. And we know for a fact that they've been around 60,000 years. Again, we have their records, not the, not their books, but I'm saying the, the records that they left behind, meaning the stuff that they left behind, the tools, the, the bones. We have their civilizations for 60,000 years. How then can mankind be 6,000 years old? Response as Muslims, who said they're 6,000 years old? We didn't say that. That's your narrative, O Christians and Jews. It's not our narrative. And so for us, we have no problems extrapolating uh, Adam alayhi salam to whenever you guys want to. Whatever scientist that's Muslim wants to come and say, hey, there was somebody that we can all link back to that's half a million years ago. No problem, doesn't matter to us. 150,000 years ago, no problem, doesn't matter to us. Somebody comes and says, hold on a sec, Sheikh, we know for a fact that Isa was only 2,000 years ago, Suleiman was 3,000 years ago, Ibrahim was 4,000 years ago, and these are all the prophets yani, that we know in the, in the Quran and whatnot. So Ibrahim is around 4,000 years. And this is, yani, it seems to be the case that um, Ibrahim is around 4,000 years ago. It's the early Bronze Age and the facts match up. It does look like he was from that time frame. So if we say that Adam existed 150,000 years ago, what we're saying is that between Adam and Ibrahim is literally over 145,000 years, right? The response to this is, so what? So what? It does not affect the Quranic narrative at all. The Quranic narrative remains firm and it doesn't matter if you were to say Adam is 150,000 years, Nuh is 130,000, Ibrahim is 4,000. Nowhere in the Quran does it say that Nuh and Ibrahim are 100 years apart, 1,000 years apart, nothing. We have no definitive knowledge, so whatever people want to believe, it is fine from the Quranic paradigm. And also, by the way, one can gently point out that uh, the hadith mentions that there were 124,000 prophets, right? Well, I mean, the Quran only mentions 25 of them. So where are the rest of the 130, 100 and, uh, uh, 115,000, 119,000, uh, uh, 975, where are they now? How come they haven't been mentioned? One could say there were so many small generations and pockets here and there for 100,000 years, I don't know. My point is, 
the notion of Adam alayhi salam being 6,000 years old is not an Islamic one, it's not a Quranic one, and we do not have to champion it whatsoever. We have no theological issues of extrapolating the time of Adam to be as long as uh, geneticists and evolutionary biologists want it to be. So that is point number seven. Point number eight for us, point number eight, is that the Quran does not negate the existence of other life beings or forms. We have no problems whatsoever, unlike some Christians and some other folks who don't believe in dinosaurs and whatnot, or other hominids, they say that these are all fakes or these are all you know conspiracy theories. No, we're not, alhamdulillah, we are people of intelligence and aql, and we believe in facts. And these are actual bones that we know for a fact, these were uh, creatures and these were entities and these were hominids, whatever it might be. And carbon-14 DNA is pretty much yaqini. Now that much is my area. I have a degree in engineering and chemical engineering. I have uh, you know, a, a minor in chemistry and I can tell you that carbon-14 dating is yaqini. Now it gives you a variable from this date to that date, but it is definitive. There is no trickery going on here. And when we date a bone to be 100,000 years rough, it is roughly 100,000, it wasn't just put a year ago, it is impossible, you know, unless Allah wills a miracle obviously, but it is impossible otherwise. So, when we discover fossils of other life forms, in fact, uh, recently uh, they discovered a, 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 a reptile, I mean, um, they discovered a dinosaur's egg that had been frozen, and so the embryo of the dinosaur was actually still there, you know, we were worried about they might hatch it or whatever, but subhanAllah, anyway, it was just, um, uh, they discovered it was frozen in Siberia, they discovered an actual embryo of uh, uh, the dinosaur, right? This is clearly, clearly a, a living species at one point in time. What do we do with all of these? The hominids, Neanderthals, Denisovans, right? What do we do with all of these? The response, why does it bother us? Allah says in the Quran, وَيَخْلُقُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And He has created what you do not know. He has created what you do not know. And Allah Azza wa Jalla reminds us, وَمَا أُتِيتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You have not been given anything of knowledge except a very small amount. So we have no problems affirming multiple species, multiple creations besides us, no problem whatsoever. Dinosaurs and Denisovans and Neanderthals, we will say though that we believe that our species of Homo sapiens, us human beings, we were blessed in ways that they were not blessed. And we were blessed with intelligence and with speech, bayan. That's something we will, we will say that our level of intelligence and our capability to speak it is a gift given to us by Allah that no other species had. So this is something we firmly believe. Other than this, if there were species that were more intelligent than primates, they could use stone tools, but and they could communicate in basic, you know, grunts or you know, one-word syllables or whatnot. And they were humanoid, but not human. Neanderthals, let's say, right? I'm just saying if they were. That doesn't, it doesn't bother us theologically. It means nothing to us because Allah Azza wa Jal told us He created what we do not know. And we will affirm facts from biology. And the fact that Neanderthals, Neanderthals existed is an undeniable fact. The fact that there were hom humanoids, hominoids, uh, hominids, other than us, this is an undeniable fact. So this is the eighth point here. And by the way, go back to one of my previous lectures, I don't know, 10 lectures ago, when we talked about this theory of the uh, the tin and the bin and the rin, remember those ones, right? When uh, some of our classical scholars posited that there were beasts that were not human beings that were on this earth and that they caused fitna and fasad. And that is why the angel said, oh Allah, why are you creating a new species? Why are you doing this when we are here and we will praise you and whatnot? So there is a hint in our tradition, even though it is not Quran and Sunnah, but there's hints in our tradition that perhaps there were species other than mankind, before mankind. And they were not exactly us, but they were something like us. So if one were to say that yes, we believe, or not we believe, but it is possible to believe, then that is not problematic whatsoever. This is point number eight. Point number nine, second to last, penultimate. Point number nine, the Quran, does not inform us how the other species came about. The Quran never tells us 
that Allah Azawajal sent every one of the species down and all of the descendants of those are from that species. The Quran does not say so. The Quran does not say that Allah sent down the cow and the chicken and the sheep and the wolf and the lamb and then all of these are thou coming forth from that. Not at all. No. And so if somebody were to say that, and again, I'm, I'm being very careful, listen to my words carefully. If somebody were to believe in evolution of all species, except Adam alayhi salam, we have to make an exception, that's point number 10. But let's remove Adam from the picture. If somebody were to affirm everything that modern evolutionary biologists are saying, if somebody, please don't misquote me, I'm not saying I do, I'm saying if somebody were to believe this and remove Adam from the equation and say that all other life forms are interlinked together and every single species on earth is interconnected and that we all other than Adam and the children of Adam have emanated from one life form, if somebody were to say this, it does not contradict the Qur'an. They haven't lost any iota of Qur'anic belief, not a single verse is contradicted, not a single principle of Islamic theology, nothing. So again, my job is to tell you what a Muslim can believe. And remember, I'm not positing this as true. When I gave a lecture about this topic many years ago, a lot of people misunderstood that I am preaching this. No, I'm not preaching. I am saying if somebody were to believe this, then it is a legitimate belief from an Islamic standpoint and it does not conflict with our tradition whatsoever. Now, if somebody doesn't, that's up to them. It doesn't, it's not, I'm not saying that they must believe in this. Now, uh, somebody, uh, a number of people said to me, doesn't Allah say in the Quran, that It's one of the last verses of Surah Yasin. And they say, doesn't this indicate that Allah created the animals as they are? And go back to the tafsir. This is not the understanding of the verse. Go back to the tafsir. Go back to Qurtubi. Go back to Ibn al-Jawzi. Go back to any of the classical tafsirs of Tabari. You will understand that this is a misunderstanding. What Allah is saying is that uh, uh, Allah Azza wa is saying that we, it is our power that created these animals. There is no uh, hint that Allah is saying we created the original animal and all of these animals come from the original. No, Allah is simply saying we gifted them these animals. It is our power, our, and Allah is saying that I created these animals. How Allah created is not mentioned. The Quran does not mention how. By the way, if anything, yani one could read in generic statements, Allah says in the Quran that uh, we created everything from water. Right? So if one, one were to read in, in and of itself, it's not problematic. So again, point number nine, please understand what I'm saying here. The theory of evolution as it stands is not problematic theologically if you remove Adam and Homo sapiens, human beings from the picture. If a person were to believe every other life form emanated from a previous life form and were to say that Allah used the mechanism of evolution, Again, all power is to Allah. One of the things that we differentiate from secularists and from people who deny God is that they say this chaos is coming out of chance. This randomness is just happening. And we would say, no, this is a cause and effect. And Allah created the cause and Allah created the effect. And Allah links the cause and the effect. So if you were to believe in what is called intelligent design uh, for non-humans, if you were to believe that Allah used the mechanism of evolution to bring about different species over many millions of years, as Muslims, we don't have any problem with this. For all life except one. And this leads me to my final point. The final point is that given all of the above, we simply cannot affirm the theory of evolution as it stands when it comes to Homo sapiens. We as Muslims respect the scientists in there. We're not making fun of them. We're not saying they have evil intention, but we have a data point that they don't have. It's really, that's all that it is. We have a fact that they will not look at as a fact. We bring to the table of scientific facts, a theological fact. We don't expect them to believe in that theological fact, but we do. And that theological fact is what? We believe that Adam alayhi salam existed, that he was the first human being and that he was the father of all other human beings. It's that simple. 
Scientists can bring all of the facts to the table that they want. We just add this one fact to the table. With this one fact, Muslim evolutionary biologists should try to understand what alternatives can be given and should see what they can bring uh, to the scientific community as faith-based Muslims. But it's not my job to do so. We firmly believe that Adam السلام, existed, that he is the first human being, that he is the original human being, and that all of mankind is descendant from him and his spouse. We don't believe that he existed in any particular time frame. He could have existed at any time, 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, a million years ago, doesn't matter to us. Our theology will not be affected, but we must believe that our creation is not like the rest of the creation. Rather, we are special. And we do believe this in multiple ways. Allah tells us in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have honored the children of Adam. We are not like the rest of the species. Allah gave us what He did not give other species. Allah gave us intellect. Allah gave us language. Allah gave us bayan. Allah gave us metacognition. All of these things are unique to human beings. We are not simply products of chance. We are not simply, you know, the result of random mutations and chaos. No, it is simply too perfect of a creation to simply attribute this to randomness. On the contrary, there is a creator and Allah created everything and He especially preferred and created us over the rest of the creation. That much is logically undeniable and the Quran also mentions this. Now, I wrote a paper along with uh, another uh, Dr. Dr. Nazir Khan, uh, we co-authored a paper about evolution uh, and, and the Quran, and you can Google it, you know, uh, Dr. Yasser Khadi, Dr. Nazir Khan, evolution, you will find it uh, on Yaqeen's website. And so we co-authored a paper, and I will uh, read from that in my concluding uh, remarks. I will read from that paper, uh, and you can read it online, the full paper. It's a little bit technical language, but so uh, if you uh, uh, get lost with it, you can read the actual paper, because I know that when you speak, language is simpler than when you write. So I quote from from our own paper. Setting aside debates about their rational plausibility or probability, there is nothing in Islamic scripture that explicitly negates the concepts of abiogenesis, uh, genesis, abiogenesis, genetic mutation and diversification, natural selection, the existence of hominid species, or a common ancestor for all biological life on earth, excluding only the descendants of Adam. Moreover, one can certainly imagine a scenario where hominid species were gradually evolving on earth and right at the point in time when evolutionists would predict the emergence of modern humans, God miraculously inserted the children of Adam, yani Adam and Hawa and the children of Adam. Let us suppose that these Adamic species are biologically, anatomically, physiologically and genetically indistinguishable from the would-be species one would have predicted to have emerged based on the preceding population of species in evolutionary history. They appear to occupy the exact same position on the phylogenetic tree. The occurrence of such a scenario is theologically plausible and would be impossible to disprove empirically since it is a metaphysical assertion. This is not to affirm that such a scenario did take place. Indeed, there are ongoing arguments that may continue to be entertained about the logical integrity, numerical probability, and empirical substantiation of many of the aforementioned evolutionary concepts. But it simply represents one of a number of possibilities and a clear reason why there should be no consternation amongst Muslims on this subject as the theological conclusions stand independent of the empirical data. This example, can be understood with analogy to a set of dominoes. And I gave this uh, analogy almost a decade ago when I debated with somebody in England about um, uh, the theory of evolution. I gave this in the public talk and now I put it in this paper here. Representing the sequence of events in evolutionary history. Just as one domino topples the next one, one species gives rise to the new species. As selection pressures continue to diversify populations and favor advantageous genes. The dominoes branch out forming divergent branches of the phylogenetic tree. However, the final domino of one branch representing humans is not toppled by the preceding domino, but instead is placed down in a manner indistinguishable from it had it been knocked down. An onlooker arriving at the scene and surveying the evidence 
would surely conclude that this domino was affected by the exact same process that caused all of the others to topple. But in this case, it was a miracle. It was something that was atypical. And this is what potentially one could, one could argue. Once again, I am not saying this is what happened. I'm saying it is possible that it happened. That if somebody wanted to say that indeed the entire process of evolution took place and a species like ours was about to emerge, it was just the right time. But right before the species actually emerged, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Adam and Hawa and they fit into the puzzle perfectly because that is how Allah creates things. Their DNA matched the DNA of such a species. Everything fits exactly because that's what Allah would do. It's not a deception here. It is rather the perfection of Allah's creation. If somebody were to argue this, now, later on, you try to piece it together as scientists are doing, and they find the final domino fallen down, they would logically conclude the domino before it caused this domino to fall. They wouldn't know that Allah Azza wa miraculously placed that domino or Adam alayhi salam at the right time and place. That is one theory out there or one alternative. And of course, the others could be posited as well. In the end of the day, brothers and sisters, I do not have a clear-cut alternative. And it is up to Muslim evolutionary biologists to help us out here. What I can say unequivocally is that I believe in the Quran. And I believe in the Quran, not because it proves science, but because it is a miracle, because it is the speech of Allah, because of its message, because of its language, because of its impact, I believe the Quran to be true. If I believe it to be true, and I am a rational person, I understand science, then I also believe that Allah's knowledge is infinite and the knowledge of scientists is finite. And so indeed I respect science, but I also know that what they posit about the origins of man is a plausible theory. It's not fake, it's not wrong, it's plausible. It's not certain, it's not definitive, but neither is it something that we dismiss. However, the Quranic story is yaqini. It is indubitable, it is 100%. So if the theory of evolution is 99%, 95%, and the Quran is 100%, well then for me, I will take the Quran and I will say, I don't know what to say about the theory of evolution. I leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know that for some people, what I have said is not gonna be good enough. For them, I say, go and research, go and read the Quran, ask Allah for hidayah and do what you can. But for me as a believer, it has never presented any major problem for one simple reason. And with this I conclude. Allah tells us in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah tells us, مَا أَشْهَدْتُهُمْ خَلْقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا خَلْقَ أَنفُسِهِمْ Allah says, you were not there to see how I created the heavens and earth. And you were not there to witness your own creation. This is a very, very powerful verse. Allah says, I didn't call you to witness your own creation. You don't know how you were created. You are trying to piece together based upon the evidences of a million years ago, of half a million years ago, of 200,000 years ago. And your attempts might be good and solid, but they are not definitive. Allah's knowledge is definitive. So we are trying, they are trying, but in the end of the day, their attempts are human and the Quran is divine. So because my belief in the Quran transcends its relationship with science, I firmly believe that there can never be an explicit clash between yaqini, definitive science, and between explicit Quran. And we thank Allah that the theory of evolution, even though it is fairly solid, it is not 100%. It is not something that is yaqini. And what the Quran tells us about Adam is yaqini. So as a Muslim, I prefer the yaqeen over the dhan, and I put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah knows best. And perhaps one day, inshallah, and when we are in Jannah, inshallah, when we have eternal time and we're able to think and talk and whatnot, perhaps one day we will understand and see and put all of this together. But in this world, we have to believe in the Quran and we have to accept what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And I conclude by reminding ourselves what Allah told us in Surah Al-Isra. وَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You have been given nothing of knowledge except a very, very small amount. 
Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. With this, dear brothers and sisters, we conclude our series on our father Adam alayhi salam, and we will inshallah ta'ala move on to the next prophet next week, bi'idhnahi ta'ala. Until then, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضاك